My parents uh, are immigrants. They came here in 1978 with two suitcases. I literally feel like I lived the American dream. My brother and I went to public schools. We had jobs. I started working when I was 12. I started babysitting in the neighborhood. And, uh, and I always had to hustle, and I watched my parents do it as soon as they got here. My mom um, had a degree in English literature from India. Nobody would recognize it, so her first job here was chopping onions at the local Wendy's, and they had to struggle. And so I think grit was part of my upbringing, and I'm actually really grateful for that because I think as an entrepreneur, probably the most important attribute is not quitting and getting through just rejection after rejection. And most of the really successful entrepreneurs I know will tell me just how many people rejected them along the way. So if you can have a thick skin around that, it's actually a huge asset. For me, it was, it was tough. As a, as a child, I was always kind of an outcast. Um, we never had enough money to shop at normal you know, clothing stores. Um, we didn't have TV at home, so I was kind of a weirdo on the playground. <laughs> um, I was a big nerd. I read books all the time and did science fair competitions. And I really found my refuge in academics and was really passionate about school. And so got lucky enough to get into Harvard, but didn't really have the money to attend. So I would, I would cobble together different jobs. I did, in fact, clean toilets for um, our campus. We call it dorm crew, but it's like a janitorial service run by students. So it's funny to imagine that at one point I was literally like scrubbing the shit off of the rich kids' <laughs> toilets. <laughs> um, however, I, I do think that a lot of that, ki that kind of work is, is truly character building. I remember that summer, I would literally calculate the value of everything I purchased according to how many toilets it would take me you know, to clean to purchase that. And I, and I think it gave me this frugality and discipline which I then brought into my entrepreneurial career. People who have endured hardship in some way can build grit and resilience from it. Sheryl Sandberg talks about this in her, in her book Option B about this idea of post-traumatic growth and using something that's tough as a growth experience. And, uh, and so I find this fascinating because I think, uh, for me, you know, I, I too hated my parents for forcing me to do some of that. And I also just was frustrated. I mean, I remember feeling surrounded by the rich kids and feeling like I was never going to fit in. Um, I think if you didn't have that kind of a background, one of the ways that you can push yourself to get beyond your comfort zone, I think is to read about failure and try to immerse yourself in more case studies um, that show you how failure can profoundly shape you. And it's hard. I mean, in the early days of a startup, I think rejection is inevitable. So there's an element of just getting back up again when you've been punched so many times that you feel like you can't. And uh, and I don't know what it is in us that is that that creates that sort of tipping point when you decide to get up again. But it's among all the entrepreneurs I know who are successful, that is the single biggest factor. It's not not quitting. There was, um, there was abuse in my family and um, I've kind of come through a lot of that in, in recent years and also understood how it shaped me. And I think for me, my refuge was in helping other people. I started doing community service in high school and for me it was this refuge. Maybe seeing people who had it even worse than me put my own suffering in context. Maybe it made me feel like I could somehow transform hurt and pain that I was feeling into something positive in the world. You know, looking back on it, I feel like maybe that was the original impetus for me to do this work. I ended up going to Ghana when I was 17, which was so random. I got, I got a scholarship from a big tobacco company of all places. So big tobacco did something, you know, great for me, which was to fund my travel to West Africa and this volunteer program, which I could have never afforded to do. I didn't have a trust fund. Most people assume, by the way, that folks who work in social impact have like, you know, millionaire parents who just can write them checks to go to Africa. That is so not my story. I mean, I used this money to go to Ghana and um, a lot of people that my parents knew and even people in my school were like, this is completely insane. Why would you do that? This is, you know, dangerous. You're going to be by yourself as a young American woman in the middle of this, you know, West African country. And I think I would never would have done that had I not been propelled out of my comfort zone by what had happened to me as a child. And I think it creates a sense, for me at least, of, of openness and receptivity um, and maybe vulnerability that I, I might not have had otherwise. The only real power we have in the world is choosing our response. We can't choose what happens to us. We can get stuck into situations where we are abused, where we are not treated fairly, um, where any number of bad things can happen. And so the only choice we can make is how to respond. 
And I find that that knowledge gives me so much freedom because if something bad is happening to me that I can say is beyond my control, I can say, well, at least, you know, I have the power in my response to show the world what kind of person I am. And I can't tell you the number of really interesting examples of post-traumatic growth that we're now cataloging. People who've lost everything, people who've had their kids murdered in front of them, people who've had just every man manner of hardship who are able to choose their response. And rather than shutting down and you know getting more and more depressed, um, which is something that you have to get through, but the, the choice to take that painful experience and mold it into something positive for the world is I think the deepest kind of healing we can have as humans. And for me, I think part of what got me through those tough times, um, eventually as I matured, was the knowledge that I had transformed that into something good for the world. I did struggle with, with pretty severe depression in my 20s. I had a year in college when um, both my aunt and one of my best friends um, committed suicide. And we had very similar backgrounds and very similar relationships with our parents. And so, um, and both my aunt and this young woman were incredibly beautiful, incredibly bright, like the least you know, you would imagine the least likely to take their own lives. And so it was such a such a huge burden to carry that and at the time you know therapy and counseling wasn't as known maybe as it is now and there weren't very many resources so I didn't seek that out and at the same time that that was going on I was undergoing tremendous financial pressure my parents had gotten a divorce and couldn't pay for school at all so I was I was working three jobs and always trying to hustle to make ends meet with the full course load and then maybe to add to that I would go and spend time in Africa so I, I did research in Rwanda literally working on this project with victims of the genocide um, who'd had, you know, I'd go there and interview people with like machete wounds on their head from this horrific genocide, talking about having seen their children murdered in front of them. And so I didn't even understand the concept of PTSD um, and, you know, how if you're exposed to people who've undergone serious trauma, you yourself can take that on. So it was just a hot mess after, <laughs> after these few years. Um, and, then, uh, and then I graduated and I, I moved to New York City. I took a management consulting job just to be able to pay the bills and hopefully learn about business. I knew I wanted to create a business that would help people and ideally a business that would hire poor people and move them out of poverty um, but it was tough times I was alone often as a consultant getting up at four in the morning on a Monday to fly to some random city and spent most of my time alone in hotel rooms so it kind of all added up and at one point just exploded and I went through some very dark times anyone who's been through depression knows what I mean and I guess what got me out of it was, I, I feel very blessed to have found a career that nourishes me spiritually. I feel like when your core spiritual values or your morality are aligned with what you spend the majority of your time doing, it creates this, this I don't know, this unity in your soul. <laughs> and I feel like having that has been such a cornerstone of my life. It's what I often go back to when I'm really struggling or when I'm feeling depressed. I will literally like go back and read. I have a file in my Gmail of inspirational stories from our workers. Stories that people will send me about their own transformation or stories that managers of our centers will send me. And I, whenever I'm feeling depressed, I'll go back and read those just to, to ground me. I also think that connecting with other people who are suffering, there's all this research that empathizing with someone else who maybe has it even worse than you can relieve your own burden. And so as much as possible when I was in those states, I would try to immerse myself in issues around global poverty or understand what life was like for someone who had it even worse, you know, who might be struggling with depression but living on $2 a day and also struggling with HIV or some other problem. And that would help bring me out of it. I know there was meditation and mindfulness. The, um, the zooming out and contemplating nature is so helpful and there's now all this new evidence that shows that, um, that when we spend time in the wilderness, the Japanese call it forest bathing, there's a term for it, um, there are actually you know, documentable neuroscience benefits to that. Your brain chemistry changes when you're exposed to wilderness. My own view is that we become conscious of our smallness and how irrelevant these petty concerns are day to day. You know, like you'll be annoyed about, you know, I often get annoyed about something somebody said to me at the office or some political thing that's going on, you know, in my friend group or some other issue, I'm stuck in traffic and I will forget, wait a minute, okay, at the end of the day, I come from Stardust, I will return to being Stardust. None of this matters at all. The only real thing that matters is, is love 
um, you know, loving people and being loved yourself. And I think everything else is kind of gravy. So, so it's helpful to remind ourselves of that and, and contemplating vast expanses in space, or for me, it's really the ocean. I spend a lot of time in the ocean as much as possible. I'm such a California person at heart. That really helps center me and, and remind me how petty my concerns are actually. I also talk about exercise. Um, for me, various forms of exercise are totally cathartic. I'm really tightly wired and a little bit manic, and so I'm like a little hamster. If I don't get out my hamster wheel energy, it's probably gonna get scattered all over the place. So I, I kite surf, I do yoga, I'm really into dance. Um, I find rhythmic activity really helps and, and can be really soothing and therapeutic. And then I don't know if I talk about this in that piece, but, um, but for me, therapy and coaching have been hugely helpful. I don't think we talk enough about therapy. I think that if we're willing to hire a coach for better sports performance, why wouldn't we hire a coach to have better emotional performance and deepen and improve our relationships?